Let's continue. While Don Quixote praises the magic helmet, it will be enough to defend me against any stones, Sancho reiterates his desire to avoid confrontation, mocking his master's jargon and reminding him of his blanketing. Because I plan with all my five senses to avoid being injured, ferido, or injuring, ferir, anyone else. All you can do is shrug your shoulders, hold your breath, close your eyes, and let yourself go wherever luck and the blanket may take you. Don Quixote understands his squire's point and turns to Christian morality to argue back. You are a bad Christian, Sancho, because you never forget an insult once it has done you. Surprisingly, and for the first time in the novel, Ari Hidalgo now admits that his earlier explanation of the blanketing of Sancho was a lie, because instead of talking about phantoms and enchantments, he says that it was all fun and jest. And if I had not understood it in that way, then I would have returned and avenged you by doing more damage than that done by the Greeks for the abduction of Helen. And Don Quixote cannot pass up this opportunity to praise his Dulcinea, saying she is more beautiful than the most beautiful woman of ancient history. Like the previous reference to Vulcan and Mars, there are here ominous notes of jealousy, revenge, and epic violence. By contrast, the Christian morality just cited by Don Quixote proposes turning the other cheek to aggression. At this point, the ass theme that we have seen on previous occasions resurfaces, recalling an animal that is often interpreted as a metaphor for Christianity. Sancho wants to know what to do with the barber's mount, which appears to be a gray ass. He is excited. And by my beard, this dappled gray is a good one. Don Quixote considers it wrongful to force the defeated to walk and tells Sancho to leave that horse or ass or whatever you claim it is. But ironically, Sancho observes that the laws of chivalry are quite restrictive since they do not allow one ass to be exchanged for another, thus implying that said laws should be relaxed to allow the swapping of donkeys. In the end, he convinces Don Quixote to let him switch their trappings which he justifies by his rather extreme need. If they were for my own person, I would not need them more. We already know that Sancho is capable of tricking Don Quixote, and Cervantes highlights the issue of moral behavior by alluding to the change of robes performed by cardinals of the Catholic Church every Easter. In other words, this is more than a simple exchange of gear. Referring to Sancho, the narrator states that on the basis of this permission, he executed a mutatio caparum and decked out his beast with a thousand niceties, leaving him improved by a third and a fifth. Our heroes then eat and drink and return to the king's highway. Sancho asks his master for permission to talk to him about their plans for the future. Don Quixote, surely remembering the prolonged story of Lope Ruiz, gives him permission to speak, but with a stipulation. Be brief, for no speech is pleasant if it is long. Sancho argues it would be better if they were to serve some emperor or other great prince who's involved in some war and in whose service your worship might show the value of his person. Don Quixote agrees, but says that first he needs to win a reputation, and so, in the meantime, it is necessary to wander the world in a kind of probation, seeking adventures, so that by concluding some of them, one acquires name and fame. Displaying substantial hypocrisy here, Don Quixote now permits himself an extensive summation of a typical chivalric fantasy, according to which the hero reaches the palace of a king where, already received and praised by all the boys in the city, he then proceeds to the chamber of my lady the queen, where the knight will find her with her daughter, the princess, who is one of the most beauteous and perfect damsels, which one would be hard-pressed to find across a large part of the known regions of the world. Here we have a typical Petrarchan description of love at first sight between a knight and the princess of an imaginary realm. This is, in a nutshell, Don Quixote's militant love fantasy. It will happen then straight away that she will set her eyes on the knight and he set his on hers, and each will seem more divine than human to the other. And without knowing how or why, they will be captured and entangled in the intricate webs of love and sorely distressed in their hearts because they know not how they shall speaketh to one another in order to disclose their desires and feelings. 
On the one hand, this recalls Don Quixote's imaginary interactions with a number of women, from the prostitutes at the first inn to the daughter of the second innkeeper and Maritornes, and by extension, Aldonza Lorenzo, and perhaps even his own niece. On the other hand, this also works as a plot device designed to anticipate the intricate stories which will be told by the Sierra Morena lovers with whom we are about to entangle ourselves from chapter 23 until the end of the 1605 novel. Getting back to Don Quixote's story, there soon arrives at court an ugly little dwarf with a beauteous maiden who, between two giants, comes after the dwarf and who relates an adventure designed by an exceedingly old wizard and whosoever should resolve it shall be deemed the greatest knight in the world. We are not told what this adventure is, but it is a magical test for the hero knight, like having to draw a sword out from a stone, perhaps. Of course, the visitor knight succeeds at the test, adding greatly to his fame and making the princess extremely happy. In the end, her father, the king, wages a very bitter war with another as powerful as himself, and the hero serves him in battle. Before the battle, Don Quixote narrates the stereotypically tender scene of the parting of our two lovers, which takes place at the barred window of a garden, thanks to the intervention of a lady-in-waiting, or go-between, who serves the princess. There's a lot here. But one theme that emerges from Don Quixote's story is the intricate issue of lineage. The princess confesses to her maid that she is anxious from not knowing who this knight is and whether his lineage is of kings or not. Then her maid assures her that such courtesy, kindness, and courage as that of her knight can only be found in a noble and royal subject. This is a thick parody, but we have just hit on one of the major issues of Cervantes' era. Should we assess individuals in a humanistic way, according to their demonstrable talents, or are they always representatives of their social caste? Cervantes emphasizes this topic through the ambiguous and mysterious way in which Don Quixote ends his hero fantasy. He returns to court, he sees his lady at the usual place, it is agreed he is to ask her father for her hand in payment for his services. The king does not wish to give her to him because he knows not who he is. But despite all this, either because he abducts her or by some other means, the princess comes to be his wife, and her father comes to see this as his great fortune because it so happens that this knight is the son of a valiant king who rules over I know not what kingdom because I think it's probably not on the map. Then the princess's father dies, and the knight, in a word, becomes king. And his final gesture is to marry his squire to the lady-in-waiting who acted as the go-between in his love affair. 